just uh, discussing before we started, um, it's a huge subject and he lived a very long life. So regard this as something of a sampling, although I will <clears throat> probably be talking a little bit more about his homes, we are going to get have some idea um, of what, oops, you saw that, uh, of what his work is like and how it may have changed in over the years. Um, Wright has captured the American imagination as had no other architect. He was born in 1867, which is two years after the Civil War, and he died in 1959, just before Kennedy became president. He was a cultural figure as well as a designer, a staunch individualist. He was not a joiner, um, and he often had some problems. He would emerge from personal scandals or financial difficulties, and yet somehow renew himself and find uh, fresh ideas and new convictions. Um, he, some of the themes that we're going to discuss that will come in and out of this subject um, will be his, the relationship of architecture to nature. He was also a very Emily, Emily your, your papers might be near your oh, mic because okay. we're getting a lot of- He, was, he like was very enthusiastic, sorry about that. He mm -hmm. was very enthusiastic about new technology and really embraced that, which is different from some of his early contemporaries. Um, he was also aware of the effect of the automobile um, and of course, always championed the idea of the role of the individual in American society. Uh, during his seven decades, um, let's, oh. oh, I'm trying to get on. Hmm. What, try your arrow? Yeah, I, I, we just went through. Yeah. I don't know. Um, okay, there we go. There go. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, during the seven decades of his career, he was very prolific. He created about a thousand projects, 500 of which were completed. And among them are schools, museums, uh, places of worship, uh, commercial buildings, um, and of course, more than 300 houses. What you're looking at here on top is the Roby House. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And of course, the Guggenheim Museum, which some of you know in New York. Oh, okay. Wright was born in Wisconsin to a family that were mostly farmers and preachers. They were Unitarians and they had a strong belief in the, the moral fiber and independence and thinking that would have gone back to Emerson. Um, he loved the countryside. He was never a city person, although he did make his way to Chicago. He grew, he went to a, ho a local high school in Wisconsin. He attended the University of Wisconsin, not sure that he ever received a degree, but he studied engineering there. But he made his way to Chicago, which in the, uh, the decades following the big Chicago fire in 1871 was having something of an architectural renewal, a lot of excitement, a lot of building going on. And he decided after some study, he went to look and worked with some other architects and he settled down in the office of Lewis Sullivan. For the rest of his life, he called Sullivan, dear master, lieber Meister. Sullivan was very much of a modernist. Now it may not seem that when you look at the building there on the left, the auditorium building completed in 1889, but it has its own kind of rhythm. There's a simplicity to it. And he loved Sullivan, favored the idea of organic ornament. Wright probably had some hand in making the finished drawings for that auditorium building. Sullivan also took part in the great Chicago, the Columbian Exposition, which is in Chicago in 1893. Um, his transportation building was very different from anything else that was up uh, at the time in that as part of that fair. I'll show you the next picture. There's a bird's eye view of the fair. I love this, this photograph of 1893. It was built in Chicago along the lakeside and it was uh, a mecca for not only people to come visit, but it also attracted the talents of almost every major architect 
working in America. So we have all kinds of uh, white neoclassical buildings. Sometimes it was even called the White City. And to Sullivan and to Wright too, that would have been pejorative. Sullivan's building, as I showed you, um, was not white. It was that beautiful golden color with his trademark, his uh, very wide arch that you see at the bottom. But the Columbian Exposition was not something that Wright, at least the style of that was not what Wright followed. He would have visited the exhibitions. He would have seen what was there. And one of the things that he saw there was going to have an impact on his art design, his, his life uh, really. Um, and that was the Japanese pavilion, which was called Hoho Den. And you can see it in the bottom part of your screen. These were Japanese pavilions that showed traditional Japanese furniture. Wright was very much attracted to them because there was something especially compared to the more kind of bombastic architecture created by the Americans. Um, there was something very simple. There was something that was certainly geometric, but he felt that the art and the culture of Japan was somehow interwoven with its society. And he will take that idea he becomes a collector of Japanese prints, as Monet and Monet and Degas were doing in, uh, in Europe at the same time. And he will, he will uh, bring it into his, integrate it into his architecture, as we'll see. Wright was working very nicely with Sullivan, but he sometimes um, went astray. He was, had a, a five-year contract with Sullivan uh, which was that he would have work exclusively for his dear master. But Wright got a few commissions from other people in the neighborhood outside of Chicago, people who wanted him to build, build him houses. And so he started to work um, on his own. Uh, this did not meet with favor. And after a while, he had done, I think, at least eight houses, and uh, Sullivan was very angry with him, and they parted ways. Eventually, they became friends again, but it was a real uh, nasty parting. Before they were finally divorced from one another, uh, Wright had asked Sullivan to lend him or to put up $5,000 so he could build a home for himself in Oak Park, Illinois. Oak Park is something now of a great attraction for anyone interested in Wright. It is, we would say, a suburb. Then it was kind of a quiet village, and it would have been uh, a place uh, where there were people who had a certain money uh, who could have afforded to build themselves nice affluent homes. Wright's home, by uh, contrast, was rather relatively modest. Um, this is his home in Studio Park and Studio in Oak Park. You can visit these homes, and this is all this center uh, where you would first go and get information. Now, the house is, you see that tall peaked roof, and you see the band of windows. It's somewhat simple, but it still relates to what might have been the architect of the time. One of the great architects who just preceded Wright was Richardson, Henry Hobson Richardson. His Stoughton House, which was designed for a home and uh, family in Cambridge in 1882, is something that Wright would have known about. You can see here another kind of a modern American take where instead of lots of little sharp edges, there are smoother surfaces. There's a peaked roof, the windows are grouped together. There's kind of a sculptural quality as you go around that turn, that turret, and then the smooth exterior. So us, it may seem like a very much of a 19th century house, and it is, but it was a lot simpler than many houses that were being built at the time. And like Wright's work, it would have, uh, Richardson's house had a much more informal interior. Wright was, of course, a great self-promoter. Early on, he had the knack for doing what it took to advance his ideas and uh, gain commissions. He had designed a house that was called a home in a prairie town, and he submitted the design to Ladies Home Journal. 
Now, Ladies Home Journal in 1900, in the few years before and following, often included designs for people to see, just as there are magazines nowadays where you can see designs and, and ideas of um, for decorating, but also for building homes. Wright's house that he shows here in the picture is a model of what will become known as the prairie style house or the prairie house. Um, he was living in an area that was relatively flat. He thought that homes should very much sit in their surroundings. They should be grounded uh, to the earth. And so even though it's a little bit hard for you to read, this design was um, printed in, published in 1901. Now, this is not the only time that architects do this. It was a tradition, a practice that was going on for a long time. Earlier in the 19th century, Alexander Jackson Downing um, had published a book. Downing was a great, he was actually our first landscapist. He, he popularized the idea of gardening and landscape. And he brought in an architect to help him uh, make these designs. And he published a book that would be a catalog for people all across the country. And you know, if you do travel and you go through small towns and places everywhere, there are these so-called Victorian houses. And to a certain extent, it's because of Downing's effect. These books offer designs, floor plans, elevations, so that a skilled carpenter or even a, a handyman uh, could build these houses, could build a house like this uh, for a family. And you'll see that there's the floor plan and we'll discuss some of the differences. So these are fussy. This is an example of mid 19th century architecture, but the idea of using a publication to um, spread your ideas is nothing original with, with Wright. What is original with him is the idea of the prairie house. The first fully realized prairie house was done for the Ward Willits family. It's also in Oak Park, very, very beautiful. What Wright does is take certain simple materials. Sometimes he uses brick, often he uses just concrete and wood. He loved wood and he, he will conceive of his plan and then this is what comes out. The emphasis is on the horizontal. It is several stories, but it seems to be hugging the ground as he liked homes to do. It was very open to nature. Um, then you can see all the windows and yet anyone sitting inside would have a lot of privacy because of that overhanging roof. And yet if you sit and look out, you could see nature. You could walk out to terraces and have these lovely indoor outdoor spaces. One of the things you'll notice is where is the entrance? Right, like to kind of camouflage the entrance. No grand doorway, no columned entrance for him. You'd have to walk around to the side and often he included a carport and then you would walk into what would be a hall. Let me give you the next, there's the plan. This is a black and white view, but it's a better view to work with the floor plan below. You would have to come in from the side, walk into a hall. There would be stairs to go up, stairs to go down, and then you would see the rooms opening up. Now, this is a radical departure from anything else we've seen in American homes uh, at this point. What it, people who knew how he worked said that Wright would generally start with a floor plan and he would conceive of how he thought the room should be arranged. And then he would begin to introduce the elevation and how it would work and how it would look from the outside. What he does here is really new and startling because he breaks the box. Some people have described this almost like a cubist uh, drawing because everything seems so irregular. He got the idea of that asymmetry also from Japanese art and just from his own, his own preferences. But what's also very apparent is the centrality of, you see living room on the bottom, dining room off to the left, there's a porch, kitchen is in back, uh, that entry hall. And what is common to all of them is the hearth. He felt that the hearth was the center of the house, its heartbeat. And so these rooms would uh, all have some access to that um, the hearth. And in some ways that 
may seem familiar to us. It seems like a very modern concept, and it really was. When we compare it, for example, to the kind of plan that I just showed you in the, uh, by, in the Downing book, you realize that on the left, in that old fashioned 1850, but new for its time, there is a kind of box around the whole house. It could be enclosed in a rectangle or a square. Whereas when you look at the right, everything opens up and splits out. And so there's much more exposure to outside. Uh, there's much more interaction with nature. And he liked to arrange the landscaping as well so that you'd always have this, this feeling of being close to nature. He called his architecture organic. And for him, organic meant the combination of truth and beauty and nature. So always in his work, there will be some reference to the natural world and to the, the, the truth of the materials. These may seem like abstract principles, but they relate very much to the Japanese ideas and to other um, notions that go back to Emerson and the transcendentalists even, uh, this, this kind of independence and this, uh, the notion that truth and beauty and nature uh, are all important for our sense of well-being. When we look at the Japanese pavilion and we look at that house, the Willits house, you can see how he's learned from that roof, overhanging roof. Now he liked the overhanging roof because of the privacy, because Chicago area has a tough climate and that would pre prevent the rain or snow from coming in. Um, and he liked the look of it. And you also see he liked the, the, what is in common here is that geometric play row of windows along the edges that one right next to another and then the the windows of the living room down below a little more elongated a little more um, dramatically vertical and then the horizontal banding up above so it's this interplay of vertical horizontal that he particularly admired in the Japanese work and that very simple roof One of his finest houses, which is also um, it, near, in Chicago, it's actually right near the University of Chicago. Um, and you can visit that too. You can see it from the outside. I think when I was there, it was not open for visitors, but I believe it can be. The Roby house is very similar. It's got the same horizontality. It has the rows of windows and it has these bands. Here, the brick is bordered with a white uh, white stone. So there's a real emphasis on the vertical and it does seem to hug the ground. Now, these are not houses isolated in some acres of land. These are houses that are in a suburban or a small village feeling. In most cases here, it's the city, but even when they're in Oak Park, uh, his houses are not removed from other places, but they still have allowances made so you can be feeling that you're close to nature. Um, so the Roby house is also, you'll notice the two big chimneys for where the hearth would be and these overhangs. Uh, they are very, very beautiful. Wright was, here you can see, was using forms that he felt uh, had a purity to them. When he was a boy, his mother had gone to the Pennsylvania Centennial, the Philadelphia Centennial in 1876. Now, Wright was born in 67. His mother was probably his greatest fan. She knew he was gonna be something wonderful. She saw what were then a new thing, the Froebel blocks. Froebel was a Swiss or German uh, founder of the kindergarten movement. And he had made a series of what he called were gifts for children. You have all probably seen these simple maple blocks. It's a standard in every nursery school and even probably in, in homes if you have uh, children or grandchildren. They are blocks that are formed um, in squares, rectangles, sometimes squared off columns, and they're fun to build with. They, they feel good to your hands, those wooden blocks. She, the gift was given to um, the right. He was not quite as young as it might have been intended for, but he used them and he, built, he was building with them when he was uh, a young kid. And he said he always had the feel of those blocks in his hand. 
When you look at the simple kind of structure there that someone made with the Froebel blocks, you get the feeling of that in the Roby house as if he's just made it with a series of these wonderful blocks. Uh, and so uh, that too is one of the important influences on Wright. When we think about it, we've already covered now three of the important influences that he acknowledged. One of course was Lewis Sullivan. The other was the Japanese art and architecture. And the third were the Froebel blocks. And throughout his life, these influences are evident in his architecture. Now, I couldn't show you interiors, but uh, of each of the houses I've shown, the Roby or the Willits house, but we do have a Frank Lloyd Wright interior uh, close enough to us. This is the living room of the Little House, the, the Little is the name of the family, uh, which is found in Wayzata, Minnesota. Um, it was designed in 1912, 15. The house was about to be torn down, but the Met somehow arranged to save the living room. And it now resides in the American wing at the Metropolitan Museum. It's a little bit out of the way, but it is just the best for, for getting an idea of, of Wright's design. Wright liked to do everything about his houses. You didn't simply get a Wright house, you got right furniture, you got right design, decor, interior decorating, you got the right paint colors, you got the right pictures hanging on the wall and the rugs and so on. Not everybody was so happy about that, but most of his clients were quite pleased with the results. And this is one uh, house, one interior there where you can see what his the inside of, for example, a living room would look like. He would have designed the lighting. You can see the ceiling and the, the woodworking on the ceiling and the band of light coming down from the floor, from, from above. Uh, you might've seen some objects sometimes. Uh, it was okay, Indian ceram American Indian ceramics, Japanese things, um, and the furniture that was always to his, his taste. Wright also, as part of his design, would have designed the windows. And the Roby House originally did have these leaded windows. Now, the leaded windows serve a very interesting purpose. You can see out very easily when you look through a leaded window. And you see these beautiful geometric designs. But it wouldn't be easy for people to see in. So uh, there again, Wright is very conscious of this bat, the, the blend, the balance between uh, inside, outside, and privacy, and yet viewing what you want to see of nature uh, outside. One of the most beautiful sets of windows he made were for a, a playhouse to accompany the Coonley House in Riverside, Illinois. And they are just, you've probably seen reproductions of these, wonderful as if they're sent balloons of some sort, and yet they're all formed from what really would be geometric designs. And then there's that little motif of the American flag down below. So this is where uh, Frank Lloyd Wright would have been um, by 1912. He didn't do, in this period where he was so busy in so many houses, um, he also had time to design certain commercial buildings as well. For example, he did this uh, Larkin building. The Larkin Company was a soap company and uh, they were in Buffalo. You'll notice so far the places I'm mentioning were either very close to Chicago, in Chicago, or around the Great Lakes. That's where his reputation had spread. So he's up toward Wisconsin or in, uh, you know, around the Great Lakes into Buffalo. Um, the Larkin building was built near railroad tax because it was a soap company that worked from a catalog, a mail order, well, or train order catalog. And so um, it was something that was novel at the time, but you can see from the outside, it's very simple. Those simple planes of the building done with the brick, the rise of windows, you can see them a little bit on the left, or here you see it from the uh, interior view. And when you're inside, you have this wonderful rise of the stories. There's a clear roof and then wonderful use of special glass. He loved plate glass. 
That would have been new at the time. He loved the built-in furniture. That was something new at the time. And so uh, the Larkin was really a, a very innovative building. Um, the glass doors, it also was air conditioned. We're talking about 1903 to 1906, and it had radiant heating, which is something he continued in many of his buildings. Um, the desks that were built in meant that space could be used very effectively and efficiently. And with the light from above, it really was an inviting place to be. Sadly, and we'll see this happens to a number of Wright's buildings, it was demolished in 1950, but at least we do have the, the wonderful photographs that show us what it was like. He also did a temple for a Unitarian congregation, and this is in Oak Park. Now, um, on the outside, you'll see again, this was built in the early 1900s, very, very simple. The smooth planes, you can almost imagine him putting it together with those Froebel blocks. There's a horizontal area in the middle. There would have been some steps so you could come up and enter. There are sort of columns, they're really pillars, um, but all of these horizontal and vertical shapes are so well integrated that they form a wonderful balance and the building sits very comfortably on its ground. You can visit this one. Uh, this structure, and it's just beautiful inside. The interior is not large. You'll see the seats are arranged in kind of balconies. Um, the materials are the concrete walls, and then some of them in stucco, some of them are um, a kind of greenish color bordered with wood, a, a specific kind of wood that Wright wanted, and then a very pale golden yellow. You can see the, uh, the shapes of the lights, and they almost remind me of that Coonley Playhouse, uh, the, uh, the, the stained glass window motifs, because he loved those pure geometric shapes. It's all about balance and harmony and a certain peace and quiet, a serenity that occurs when you have this harmonious kind of design. And that really was what Frank Lloyd Wright was always uh, trying to do. Now, harmonious design is one thing, but um, Wright maybe not as following the morality even of his time, as much as you might guess when you look at this beautiful temple, which was all about individual morality and, and so on. In 1905, he had been, uh, commissioned by the Cheney family to design a house for them. Madam, uh, Mrs. Cheney, Mama Borthwick Cheney, attracted Wright's eye and they became enamored of one another. They were carrying on an affair for several years. Wright's wife, Catherine, with whom he had six children, was not going to give him divorce. But they were known, it wasn't as hidden as you might imagine, but nonetheless, they managed. He, he, they both were living in this community. Um, in 1910, Wright was invited by a German publisher to come to Europe to oversee the publication of his book. Interestingly, there was not as widespread interest in Wright's work in America, and there were no publications done, but um, not until much later. But uh, he, was, he knew he was going to be going to Germany to oversee the publication. He and Mama Cheney took off for Europe together. She had two children and they came along. Uh, they, she was living in Italy while he oversaw the publication in Germany and they stayed abroad for about a year. Now, when they came back, as you might imagine, they were not exactly welcomed into Chicago society. Right by 1911, when they were back, as he persuaded his mother to buy some land. Uh, there was a lot of family property. His mother's family name was Lloyd, and Frank Lloyd Wright adopted that as his middle name. Uh, the Lloyd family had right neighboring the Lloyd property. There was a tract of land, and his mother uh, did obtain it for Wright, and Wright built a home so that he and Mama Cheney could live comfortably and escape 
the prying eyes and have some privacy uh, where he could continue to work. What you see here is this place that's called Taliesin East. Taliesin was the name in Welsh which he gave to it. It is in Spring Green, which is a little bit west of, it's west of Madison, um, Wisconsin, if you know that geography. And he had begun it to build there in 1911. What you see here is, I wanted you to notice the rolling hills, the very soft countryside that was the most, the ideal in terms of, uh, the, for Wright in his head, that was the ideal kind of landscape. Um, but what you're looking at is some other buildings that were added a little later. This view will show you what the house must have been like. And even then it was large because he included a studio for himself. And you'll see that same, the horizontal, the horizontality, the rows of windows together. One of the reasons that architects liked to put windows one next to another, and that's something that happens quite often in uh, the modern era is first of all, they're able to do it. They can manage with the supports, but also because it lets in maximum light. Um, if any of you know, if you have one window here and then eight feet over, there's another window, you don't get as much light as you would if you had three or four windows, one next to another in that space. So this is Taliesin East. It's quite lovely, warm, welcoming, quite, quite beautiful. And he and uh, Mama Cheney were living together uh, quite happily. And Wright was beginning to do some designs. He had been invited to do some work in Japan. And in 1914, in August of 1914, a slightly crazed workman on the site set fire to the house and using an ax killed seven people. Wright was in Chicago at the time, but Mama Cheney died. Uh, it was, her children died and there were others who worked on the grounds. The man who committed this was brought to jail. He died of starvation a few weeks later. It was absolutely devastating. The house was rebuilt. Um, so it was, uh, I showed you here, it was startling. They started to rebuild immediately. There was another fire and electric wiring had gone off. It was rebuilt again in 1925. But by then it was being used also as a center for the study of architecture where Wright would have students work with him. He'd have his apprentices there. And so uh, that's why the building was, there are those other extra buildings in that view. While Wright was uh, at Taliesin East already by 1913, as I mentioned, he had gotten an offer, a possibility of doing some work in Japan to rebuild what was an old hotel, the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. He started to work on the designs and over the next years, he will be making many trips to Tokyo. He had been to Japan once in 1905, he went to Japan before he ever went to Europe because he was so enthusiastic about that culture. And at any rate, he decided to build this, ho this hotel and make it more impervious to earthquakes, which were if not routine, at least could be common in, in that part in, Turkey, in Tokyo. The hotel looks like right, and yet it has many other elements to it. In fact, it was demolished in 1968, but it was reconstructed as a museum in Nagoya, which is not far from Tokyo in 1985. The, it has the same horizontality, but it's far grander. And it has a lot of other motifs that remind us and were probably inspired by Japanese designs, by Mayan, South American Mayan designs, very lavish ornament. And we'll see that Wright goes through a period now where he is more, um, exper he's doing more of experimenting with, with a lot of ornament. He's a little more, um, uh, a little more enthusiastic in that direction. And you can see here, you can see it certainly, this is the interior. You can see all that work on the edges. You can see it here, if you notice in the interior of the lobby where he's using uh, very modern techniques to um, build the hotel. Now he's using concrete 
and he's using ways to keep it sturdy, but he also was allowing for the shifting that might take place if ever there were, um, if ever there should be an earthquake. And in fact, there was a big earthquake in 1922 and a good deal of Tokyo was destroyed. Wright's hotel stood and there was always this belief that he had designed it that way. Some of this might've been good luck, whatever it was, it's typical of Wright. People did feel that he had done something to allow for that the shifting of the earth. So now if you wanna see the hotel, you can see it in its reconstructed, moved, new moved place. But it was quite uh, an accomplishment in the 20s when it was completed. While he was going in and out of, um, uh, on his way to Japan, he was stopping in California and he began to pick up commissions there too. The house on that I'm showing you here, the Ennis house was completed in 1924. Some of you may have noticed, I'm not sure if it caught your eye, but I noticed it. It was in the real estate section a few weeks ago because it was sold for the highest amount that any Frank Lloyd Wright building ever uh, was accorded. It was over $18 million. The house is designed very differently. He's still got these kind of building block construction, the horizontality, the interlocking of some of these shapes, but the walls interior and out are finished with these, what they call textile building blocks. And he had done this in Tokyo as well. He brought uh, concrete mixing uh, and then what was necessary to make this, the materials, and he would form blocks. And you can see them here in these pictures. So each, some blocks were simply just concrete blocks. Some of them would have designs on them. Some of them would be open uh, so that they really did have quite a texture. And he uses this to form a design that he can't be separated from the construction itself. And it's a fast, and they're just wonderful, rich houses. I've been to one or two of them that are, are sometimes uh, accept visitors, um, but I've never seen the Ennis house. But can you imagine swimming in that pool and looking at this, this beautiful house all around you? The inside rooms too are finished with these textile blocks. So it was a very new way of working. And again, it's because Wright is so open to new technology and kind of experimenting a little bit. Um, so this was the Ennis house and there are several others around uh, Los Angeles. Um, and this one is closer to downtown. There are others that you can maybe see or drive by at some point. By the late 1920s, however, Wright was really losing steam in terms of his commissions. He was having some money problems. He was not really getting the work that he would have liked. He turned to writing. And this is when over the uh, late twenties into the early thirties, he does a lot of writing about architecture, about himself. He completes an autobiography based on ben, like Ben Franklin's example. And um, he struggles, he's really having a hard time. He never, as I said, he was an individualist. He never joined architectural organizations. He never had other friendships or close associations with many of the other uh, artists of the time who would have been working, uh, Mies, Corbusier, any of them who would have been working in the late 20s and doing rather advanced modern work. He is kind of sitting alone, sitting alone and doing what he can do. When along comes um, an offer that he couldn't refuse. The image that you see here is called Falling Water. And it was a house that was built for Edgar Kaufman and his, his wife, Lillian. The house is in Western Pennsylvania. It's an hour or two outside of Pittsburgh. It's in the mountains where this family had their own um, special, uh, they'd always had a, like a country, simple country house there. How did Wright come to their attention? Wright, meanwhile, and we'll, we'll back up and go into this in a moment, but Wright, meanwhile, had, uh, as I told you, had established 
uh, school a training for architects. Um, and he called this Taliesin. There was the school in the East. And then he established one that we'll see in a moment that was in the Southwest. The son of Edgar Kaufman and his wife uh, was Edgar Kaufman Jr. Edgar Kaufman had gone off. He didn't go to college. He went to art school, studied design in Europe. And when he came back, he thought he would like to study with Wright, not because he wanted to be an architect, but he thought it would be enriching. And he comes and tells his parents, oh, you've got to see Wright. And you, you, if you want to do a house, he's the one who should do it for you. The Kaufman family had made its money from a big store which still exists in downtown Pittsburgh. There were two brothers who had built up the business earlier. Their son was Edgar Kaufman. The other brother had a daughter, Lillian. So the first cousins married. They couldn't marry in, Pen in Pennsylvania. They came to New York. At any rate, they were very tied to the family business. And that family business, the Kaufman store, really did well. These were very cultivated people. They had traveled. They knew, introduced art into their, uh, into the store itself. They had special murals painted. They would have exhibitions done. They were very interested and really would have been uh, very receptive to the idea of hiring Frank Lloyd Wright. And so Wright comes to them and by 1935 will be making sketches. He visits the site and he's making sketches for this country house. Their the house originally, the cottage they had, was not on the falls, but there is the stream that's a small stream and only runs for four miles or so that then links to a larger river that links to the big rivers in Pittsburgh. But Wright said, well, if you're gonna live near the falls, you should live on it. And there are a series of cascades there's the one you see here. There's another where we would be standing if we had taken this picture and so on because the house is on a hill. And this was the view, this was the spot that Wright thought was the best place for falling water to stand. It was a very, very daring kind of composition and construction that he f wanted to do. What forms the outer platforms are cantilevers and they are of cast pre-stressed concrete. In other words, they had steel running through them, but basically they are concrete slabs that edge out over the, from the stone masonry that you can see rising up. It's hard to explain. This is a very, it's like the open plan that we first saw now coming in three dimensions uh, where it's not even on the ground. And when you say that we like his architecture likes to hug the ground, well, it's hugging the river and it's hugging a little bit of the ground in terms of those stone um, walls, but basically it seems to just float and yet it fits in so beautifully with that landscape. If you walk into the house, uh, up the stairs, you would come into a living room that is entirely uh, cased with glass and you can open the windows, you could be in and out of, of nature. Three sides of the living room uh, feature built-in banquettes and Wright's furniture. And the Kaufmans were lucky. They were very involved patrons. Um, and so sometimes they introduced some of their own things too, and Wright was okay with it. Um, but here you have the flagstone flooring in the living room and then the, the stone walls that also are seen on the inside and then the glass. You'll notice the ceiling is very low and I should have mentioned that. Wright ceilings tended to be low. We always think of grand houses that have 10, 12, 15 foot ceilings. Wrights were not so high and this one is particularly low. People made fun of him and said, oh, that's because he was only 5'8". Whatever it was, he liked that ground hugging quality. There are so many ways in the building of the house where nature is going to be the important feature. In the living room, for example, you see the stone walls and the stone is all come from, from nearby quarries. Um, there was the point where the house really was resting on these boulders and the um, Edgar Kaufman said, 
well, leave the boulders. You know, they were going to cut them down to be level on the floor. And he suggested to write, he said he was fine with it. And so around the hearth, you can see these boulders that really are coming right up from the ground in which the, the house rests. And here on the right, and this happens at least three or four times around the house, there were trees. The house was built in a forest, uh, the forest right next to this stream. And yet the beams were turned, were curved, so that that tree could still poke through. The other feature here where you can see this very long stretch of glass uh, coming up from the first floor all the way up to the top, uh, rows and rows of windows. When those windows were open on the corners, you would loot, you can see the windows, the casement windows, you would just have these uh, horizontal bands. Again, this interplay of horizontal and vertical. The coloring is a certain red, and this is politically incorrect, which Wright called Cherokee red, and he loved that color. He used it in his architecture um, quite a lot, but this is the, the coloring, and that's the only other coloring next to the stone or the wood that he used uh, for the banding. And you'll see that he has these slabs of concrete fit right into, into the stone, and that's really what counterbalances. The most dramatic part is you can see here that main floor in the living room, you could find your way through a hatch to come down into a bathing pool. And there's another place too where there's a, an entrance right to the water. These concrete platforms, however, were something very daring. Now Wright did have the engineering. He had some engineers working with him. Everyone was very nervous about these extended platforms. They tested them and tested them. And there was some uh, some people who didn't trust them. One of the legends is that Wright had to come and walk out and show them that it was safe. Well, maybe, but they did test them carefully. Before they were finished, however, there were already cracks. One of the problems with Wright's buildings, they do develop cracks and the roofs leak. And these are problems that you accept. Wright had built a house for one of his mother's uh, cousins. And when she, and there's another story, she had experienced what it was to have these leaks. She said, that's what happens when you leave a work of art out in the rain. And then there was the time around the same period a year or so later where he built a house for uh, Johnson Company and Herbert Johnson, this was in Racine, Wisconsin, and built a large house to, in addition to this spectacular office building, very daring um, office building. And um, Herbert Johnson is having dinner, one of the first celebrations in his new house. And it must have been raining. And he starts feeling water, drops of water on his head. And he was very upset. He called Wright and complained about the water and the leak. And what Wright told him, move your chair. So if you want to live in a Wright building, you know that it's going to be risky and expensive, and the upkeep is considerable. So there are cracks and all the rest, and this was despite all the most up-to-date engineering. But there is such a beauty to this place. Falling Water is certainly uh, one of the best known and most beautiful houses in this country. It quickly came to attention because Mrs. Kaufman had been friends with someone who uh, knew the uh, the head of the architecture and design department at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He was the first person outsider to come to the house and he saw it. And the next year there was an exhibition at MoMA of photographs of falling water. So Wright's reputation, again, he had been down and then he was back and swinging and you know on top of the world because of this creation. The Wright's son, Edgar Kaufman Jr., what <clears throat> inherited the house. He became uh, an architectural historian. I had him when I was in graduate school. He was a wonderful, sweet man. He loved this house. And by 1963, he had deeded it over to a conservancy to be a foundation. And so it is now run by uh, a foundation, but you can visit it. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth 
a detour if you're ever out that way. But Wright realized that not everyone was going to be able to afford 75 or $80,000 for a house. The Kaufmans were very lavish. They were very comfortable as patrons for Wright. Um, but in the Depression years, that was an enormous amount of money. So Wright felt he did feel he was very much of a, a Democrat in that sense, that he should design houses that would work for people for less money, houses even that they could build themselves. And so he designs what he calls Usonian houses. This is one that's the Jacobs house, it's in Madison. The Usonian houses um, were found in 14 states. They were all, each one may be a little different, but they are meant to be low cost, no basement, slab floors, radiant heating, all kinds of up-to-date technology, um, but very simple, and yet they still have that look of Wright's design. And Usonian stands for United States of North America. And so this was meant to be a very kind of patriotic act. The houses are quite beautiful. They are, some of them are still maintained very well. Um, often they're on these L-shaped plans. And here, the Jacobs house, when you go inside, lots of windows, floor to ceiling, all wood on the inside. The bookshelves are built in, the banquette is built in. Uh, very, very comfortable, even if modest houses. Um, but these two still take some, some care. Um, <clears throat> and notice the flat roof again. So they're still very much following Wright's principles. Um, I'll just finish up in a few minutes, if you don't mind, we may run over five minutes or so. Um, I had mentioned that in Spring Green, Wisconsin, Wright had established uh, a kind of program where architects could come and study with him. This expanded in the early 30s uh, when he designed Taliesin West, which was begun in the early 30s, the, by 1937, and it was constantly going to be advanced and built and fixed and changed. It is in Scottsdale, Arizona, near Phoenix, and it is a wonderful example of how Wright adapts to the architecture, to the climate there, and to the, um, the environment. He was feeling cold at this point. He was in his 60s, getting in close to 70s. Uh, he was cold, and the winters were cold in Wisconsin. He wanted to be someplace warm. And so he established his Taliesin West as a place where he could work, offer studies uh, for you know, hopeful, aspiring architects. And everything would be done here. You can see a very beautiful design of um, the stone and wood and uh, lots of water and fountains all around integrated into the design. The lifestyle there was based on communal living. Now, right over the years had, I didn't want to get too involved in biography, but at any rate, one of the reasons the Taliesin West was successful is because he finally met a woman whom he felt was his intellectual equal, and he felt that way about Mama Cheney too, but this was a Russian-born woman, Olga Ivana, and she and Wright together helped develop Taliesin West. Uh, the idea was that any of the fellows who came to work with Wright would also take care of cooking, cleaning, fetching, building, if they needed more woodwork, uh, wood for fires, if they needed more stone to add on anywhere. It was really meant to be a kind of communal style. It didn't suit everyone, but there would be about 20 fellows there at a time. <clears throat> and this is what uh, really also helped expand Wright's style. Many of the architects, the young men who worked there, uh, went on to carry forth a lot of his ideals all over the country. So Wright's reputation has come up and already in the 40s, he's getting an offer from the Guggenheim Museum, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York, that maybe, or at least the idea of the museum, that they wanted uh, a new um, kind of design, they needed a new building. The Wright's, Wright's design and museum um, was roundly challenged. There were many people, and still are many people, who say, how could he do this? 
he never liked New York. He never liked the city. And people said, oh, that's why he did this, because it's so awful. But it isn't so awful. It's very interesting. Now, how can this fit into his herb? How does this work when we compare it to his other architecture? It is based on something organic. It definitely sits on the ground. It's got these good, strong horizontals uh, that, that hold things in place. And rising up is an inverted ziggurat. Now, a ziggurat was an ancient uh, Mideast kind of um, sanctuary. And it was like a spiral, um, but it was smaller at the bottom, larger at the top, uh, larger at the bottom going up, smaller to the top. Frank Lloyd Wright turns it upside down. It's almost like a special sh a snail shell that would also be an organic um, association or an organic link. Whoops, sorry. What's astonishing about the Guggenheim is that it does work within the city grid. Maybe we've all just gotten used to it, but it does you know, stop you where you are. And it's a delightful break from all the vertical and horizontal. And because it's across from the park, it's got a little more from Central Park. It has a little more breathing room. What we have to appreciate is just how complicated it was to build this. Um, the, the dome is many, many feet higher from the ground floor. And you get, you, uh, see whatever art you want to see by ascending this sloped ramp. That ramp will be slightly different with each level because of the shape of the, of the, of the whole shell. So as you're walking, and you can think what it might mean for the engineering involved, as you walk on the one circle, it's going to be that that circle is going to be a little larger. It's a spiral. So it's not only the circle, it's rising and it's getting larger and larger. And then you finally come up toward the top where you have this very dramatic view or from the bottom where you look up to this glass dome. Um, it is quite sensational. People complain, well, it's maybe not so good to see art. I would argue that it's very interesting because you're in smaller bays. And so each time as you go up, you might be able to see if they're normal size pictures easel size three or four works and really focus on them. And then you go on to the next. And best of all, you can look across and see what you've seen, see what you might be seeing ahead. And there's a wonderful sense of openness about it. If you haven't been there for a while and maybe when the pandemic is over, go and visit again and, and see what you think. But it is uh, a very, very beautiful and a unique kind of space. By now, uh, in 1959, Frank Lloyd Wright is in his 90s. He's 91, 92. So he is still at the peak of his game. He is remarkably uh, imaginative, extremely creative. He was always coming up with new ideas, using new materials. And, and that's what he uh, is really known for. The rabbi at the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, also wanted to have Wright design a new synagogue for the congregation. And this synagogue still stands and you can visit it. Um, it is, uh, reflects a, a collaboration, a very nice kind of collaboration between the rabbi and the architect. Uh, and so they discussed the, the symbolism for some reason Wright felt that this shape reminded him of a burning bush. Um, again, it's very unusual. And it does have this low slung. You see, hardly see that doorway, but you can see the, uh, the, the base that holds it so comfortably. And then you see this rise. It's all translucent. You can see through it. You can't tell in this picture, but you would be able to see through it. And when you're inside, there's a very steep rise to the seats. So you're not looking around anybody's head. You can see the glass walls or see the, the colors of the sky outside, and you get this feeling of, you know, a kind of heavenly rise. Now, there are uh, some wonderful lines that, that um, Wright wrote about this in his ex exchange with the rabbi. He, people asked if he was going to use some stained glass, and he said, since this is God's temple, I prefer to have him color the glass 
And Wright wanted the congregation to walk in and he said, feel as if they were resting in the very hands of God. So he has a very strong spiritual feeling that we first saw in that early Unitarian church, but that was all solid. And now late in his life, just before his death, we see that he's coming through with something that's all about light and air and, and the colors of the heavens really opening up. Um, he was, oh, sorry. He, the building actually opened after he died. Um, Wright died, he was at 92 and he had lived and worked right through to the very end. If there's one way we can sum up his architecture, I guess, he would say, he would agree, the secret of Wright's architecture, he would have reminded us, will not be found in its surfaces, but it's in its heart. So thank you. There's a lot more to be said about Wright, but I hope this would be um, a good way for you to start thinking about him. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. What a wonderful lecture. Um, thank you. Getting a lot of thank yous in the chat, as well as a couple of questions. Um, let me start with Bonnie Frankel. She wants to know if Falling Water was the first, if not one of the one of the first residential use of the cantilever. It was probably one of the most extreme for the time. Um, and they Wright had experimented with uh, reinforced concrete in earlier buildings, and he had done it in different places, but it was it was used in in other modern architecture but this was really to an extreme uh these platforms I, they take your breath away i mean they just are hanging out so it's much more of a cantilever and i think in in the advancing years the technology and the engineering would have been even more advanced um, so it was pretty daring for the time yes um thank you and I, i'm gonna as we as you can Raise your hand if you're not familiar how to do that because there's so many of us, I don't wanna put the unmute on. Go to your reaction button and there is a raise hand option, which Judy Davis, uh, let me unmute you. I see your hand is raised. Go ahead, Judy. Hi, yeah. um, many years ago, we all read uh, Loving Frank. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, was about Taliesin, but uh, a, a different woman. Yes. And uh, it wasn't very flattering to him as far as his no. business sense and paying bills and being no. kind to people. No, I don't think you would remark that you would think of him as a particularly good friend. Um, his son Lloyd said he never cared about money. He would stuff bills in his pocket. He had to the point that he would be irresponsible about money. And that often got him in trouble because almost everything that he built would end up being more expensive. And sometimes patrons weren't so happy. In terms of women, he um, had uh, had the affair with, with Mama Cheney, the love at that point of his life. His wife would not divorce him. She got a divorce. Um, and then there were some years where he wasn't with anyone. And then finally he was with another woman um, and he wanted to marry her. And Kitty, finally, his wife, Catherine, did give him a divorce in 1922. He took up with another woman who was, I don't feel it's fair to re really repeat uh, some of the gossip, but she was a little bit unhinged and that marriage didn't even last a year. And it was after that that finally he met uh, Olga Vanna, who we called Olga, and eventually, um, after his second divorce, he was able, they were able to marry, and that was a fairly stable relationship. But he was, he was a difficult man, there's no question. Thank but he you. did beautiful work. Yes, Gilda? Gilda's iPad. I don't know your last name, Gilda, but let me unmute you. I see you have a question. Go ahead, Gilda. Can you hear? Can yes. hear? Yes. Go okay. Yeah. So I, I went to Falling River, and and I it was wonderful, but uh, all the bedrooms were very small. And apparently, his philosophy was that he wanted people to be in the the um, 
what do you call them, uh, outside uh, public, 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 spaces. public rooms, yeah. public yeah. places. So I think a lot of his bedrooms were small because he lo- he believed in public places. Right. One of the things that that's absolutely true, and that's what surprised me there too. The main living space is quite beautiful, and I think what at least my reaction was, oh, I could live here. You know, it wasn't so grand. It wasn't something that was so over the top. You know, this was not a McMansion. It was really eminently livable, but they were at the bedrooms were small, and that's true. I think in the um, the prairie the prairie houses do that they're not enormous; they spread out into the landscape, but the core of the houses are not so big. Yeah, Emily, as I was watching, I was wondering. Um, I've seen so many uh, images of his work, but you never see the kitchen, and I just wonder why nor a bathroom and how he how he designed rooms like that if you're aware i do the kitchens i'm not sure enough but most of his early houses were built with the idea that there would be servants in the first decade of the 20th century even uh, you know i would say relatively modest houses would have servant quarters so i don't think anybody cared about the kitchen because the owners of the house were probably not there very much. Um, but he did design bathrooms. And I could have shown you, I know in Falling Water, you can see them in, in some of his um, commercial buildings. He was very proud of using some elevated toilet, you know, that was not on the floor. Um, so he was, he was very much in tune with modern materials uh, and, and modern devices like that. Um, one of the things that he used early on, um, one of, it might have been Johnson Wax, was Pyrex when it was first, um, when it was first patented. He used Pyrex tubes to make ceilings and to do kind of design work because it's glass, it's clear, but it was so much stronger and you could glue it together. So um, the bathrooms, I think there are some examples you can see, but I don't remember any kitchens either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. All right. Linda, Linda Cohen, let me unmute you so you could ask your question. Linda, what's going on? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Ask. Okay, Linda, you can unmute yourself. Linda? There you go. Great. Okay. Um, And I saw an exhibit once about Japanese pottery uh, over over many hundreds, thousands of years, whatever. Mm. And in the wall labels, they talked about the importance of the clarity of form that Mm. was developing, which is certainly with right, the influence of Japanese architecture and Japanese art in general was certainly the, all these buildings that you showed us, the clarity, but also the clarity of the materials, all yeah. the, the stone and the bricks that were horizontal, you know, with this, yeah. in, uh, encouraging that, that clarity of form. Thank yeah, you. simplicity. And that's where, you know, he doesn't include so many different kinds of materials. And that's also true, I guess, to a Japanese aesthetic. Thank you, Linda. Um, good point. Thank you. Someone named iPad. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, thank you. This is Mara. I put in the chat a few things that I learned about him that I thought were interesting. First off, with all due respect, when Gary um, built the Disney Hall, that also leaked, you know, as soon oh, as yeah. it opened. Sure. So, you know, <laughs> you know, things happen. And the other thing is, um, uh, when uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, commissioned by the Guggenheim family to build the Guggenheim Museum, he scouted out locations and he wanted to put it in the middle of uh, the Bronx Zoo. And Robert Moses, who's a relative by marriage, you know the story, Emily? No, that's wanted- good. I'm glad you're mentioning it. Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember that? So uh, what he said, Robert Moses said, there's no way you're putting it in the Bronx Zoo, which made sense because it was again, organic in nature. He says over here, Museum Mile, he says the ladies who lunch are not taking a bridge or a taxi over the, uh, to the Bronx. 
And that's why we have it there. And the last thing is when he built the uh, uh, museum and you see uh, the spiraling of it, he got that idea from a parking garage. Yeah. So I just find him right. just so yeah. clever, so clever. He had such a wide ranging imagination, you know, and he didn't, he, he anything was fair game for him, you know, for his creativity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I mentioned with, I spoke with Emily a little earlier. Somebody is reminding us that in Great Neck, the Rube, R-E-B-H-U-H-N house is in Great Neck Estates. If someone could send me a picture of that so that I, Emily was asking me about it, um, or I'll go and take a picture and send it to you, Emily. Oh, I would love to see it. I would imagine it might be one of the Usonian houses. Could be. It could be, although Great Neck Estates has some. It could be. I don't know. Tongs, but I would love uh, to see a picture of it. I'll have to look it up and and find out. Yeah. Can you just give me the spelling again? Um, R E B H U H N, mm -hmm. and it's in Great Neck Estates. Oh, good. Revgen. Okay. Yeah. And That's Ruth good. B, let me unmute you. Okay, Ruth B. I don't know why this up. There you go. Go ahead, Ruth. Okay, yeah. Well, I had just a little sort of funny story about Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, we visited the Dana Thomas House in Springfield, Illinois. Right. And I, uh, a story that the caretakers told was that uh, he, after building this house, uh, he would come visit every once in a while and he, he would notice and if the woman who owned the house had moved a piece of furniture or painting or something, he would move it back. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, he would have been impossible. Really impossible. Right. That's funny. Very funny. And Bernard Leaf, let me unmute you so you could ask your question. Okay. I'm, I'm Carlene Heller. Um, I remember a community, it was somewhere in the Yorktown Heights area right. where there were probably about, I remember a friend living there maybe 35 years ago. Are you familiar with that community? Yes, and I think that's where the, there are some Usonian houses. Okay, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, quite interesting. Beautiful, like a woodsy, very grand woodsy. Area. And, and in fact, um, he also thought he would have liked if the owners could even take part in the building. That the parts, one of the reasons they were less expensive, is because the parts could be prefabricated, the walls and so on, in ways that would have been very new at the time. And so they could be, if you were handy, uh, could be built. Uh, you know, by uh, layman, so to speak. That's Thank you for a wonderful talk. Your knowledge is extensive and I really appreciated oh, everything thank you. you taught us about. Thank you. And I love your questions. This is such a good group. Thank you. Uh, I wanted we, to have a, we have an address. It is 9A Myrtle Drive. Thank uh -oh. you, David Steiner for, for, and also someone said, if you Google Frank Lloyd Wright in Great Neck. You'll okay. see the pic you'll see the pictures. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, oh, wonderful. Good. Okay, so we have a few, time for a few more questions. Yeah. Let's go with Marion Caslo, Caslon. Now I know how to do it. Hi, my Hi. husband and I played golf in Hawaii at the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, golf course. There, he had built that house primarily for Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller, but they never lived right. in it. So I don't know what the story was, but it became part of a very famous golf course in Hawaii. Yeah. It's, it's Are you familiar with that? I I just knew that there was a house for the the Arthur Miller Marilyn Monroe part of it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Timothy Callahan. Go ahead. You're How many have you had the children? His own children. Good afternoon. Timothy? Here you Hello, I'm on. Are you there? I am here. Go ahead. I, I Can you hear me? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, great. Hi. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, again, a uh, couple of questions. One, when's your next Zoom presentation? Because oh, for well, a lot of us, we'll get checked on that one. That's very nice. Thank you. And we'll, we'll arrange something else. Yes, thanks. This uh, is, 
Emily's been here a few times and we can't get enough. So okay. Under, under, understandable. Uh, the next is the um, in Chappaqua and Pleasantville, the border there, there's a whole Usonia community. That's yes. right. Um, it's really very, it's very charming. But yeah. as someone mentioned earlier about how small the rooms are, in the home, they're, they're small. very choppy. They're yeah. very choppy, and it's not not like a what we would think to want to raise a, a family of four. In. Well, so some of them also them. might have been changed over the years because they might not have been comfortable, and who knows what got rearranged. You know, it's very hard to tell. Understood. Um, so one of the questions I have. Is, Regarding the Kaufmans, they had such a close relationship with him during Falling Waters. There apparently was a falling out when they wanted their vacation home in Palm Springs that Richard Neutra did it instead. That's right. So what was the falling out based that he didn't want to work with them because they were kind of nutty or? No, I, I'm not sure. You no, know, I I'm not sure. I I know I had read that re somewhere um, that whatever the reason was because I don't think there was a falling out. They stayed. He stayed friendly with Edgar Kaufman Sr. Uh, really mm -hmm. until Kaufman died. Who he uh, Kaufman predeceased. Right. Um, but it's interesting because the Neutra house is quite spectacular, and Neutra was yeah. another very modern, uh, wonderful architect who was working a lot in California. Um, maybe they just wanted something different, maybe, right? Uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember what the reason. I don't know that it was a falling out exactly, um, mm. but it could have been, there could have been some problems. Yeah. Okay, thank thanks you so much. I, again, look forward to your next presentation. Well, thank you, great. great. Uh, Evelyn Sh Sugarman, go ahead. Hi. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Taliesin West, when it was being built, the city of uh, Scottsdale, Phoenix, was putting up their electrical grid, and it blocked his view, and he got into a big huffing fight with them. Uh, he lost. It's yeah. still there. It's yeah. still there. And when you're there, you know, you can see it, but he got into it. He was very offended by the fact that yes. they were blocking his view. Yes. <laughs> he was a character. There's no question. He was not an easy man. Yep. And he had such a thing about nature. I, there was one quote that I'd meant to include. Uh, and it speaks to his, his <laughs> not modesty, but to his character. He said, I believe in God, only I spell it nature. <laughs> <laughs> So anything that would have blocked his view in nature, we would not have been happy. That sums it up. Yeah. Uh, Marion Caslow, I called on you before and I apologize that somehow um, I'm trying to unmute you. Can you, can you, there you go, Marion. Yes, I, I shared, I don't know whether you heard me or not about the uh, house in Hawaii that was planned for uh, Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller. Yeah. And they made it into a golf course in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. yes. I did mention that yeah. before. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. And uh, Alice, you've been very patient. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Okay. I First of all, thank you so much. Uh, and you presented the life of a genius. And, yeah. I and I feel so old, but I feel still young at heart. <laughs> but I remember when I went to the Guggenheim when it opened in the late 40s, and I, I was beginning to appreciate art. And uh, the reaction I had and uh, the feeling of walking around the cancel efforts and so on, uh, I haven't been back for a long time. Uh, when I'll get back into the city, who knows? Yeah. But uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. I, I would encourage you, the, the Guggenheim works better for certain kinds of art maybe than others, um, but it's an interesting place to be. A few years ago, maybe two years ago, there was a light show. Terrell had an exhibition there, and the idea was that you had to 
um, kind of lie or sit on the floor and look up toward the door, the, the, the dome, and the lights would change. It would have been at night. It was, it was magic. Those forms just worked so beautifully. So, you know, um, it's a quirky place, but it's ours. Right. It's great. Um, uh, we have some community here. They're great because I just got another chat saying when the house in Great Neck was built, it cost $35,000. <laughs> so oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And there's one more question. I think, Judy, is this from before? Your hand was already raised? I don't know if this is old or new. This is new. Um, okay. I see that you're recording the program and I was just yes. wondering if it will be available somewhere. Yes, I'm going to send it. I'm going to send it over to our tech group who magically makes it appear on our website. Yeah, it will and be. Then, and then where would we find it? Do a, 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 if you do a search on Great Neck Library YouTube, you'll, you'll see all of our programs that we've put on there as well as other things that we record for. Okay, thank you because um, my doctors are moving from one town to another and this phone hasn't stopped all day long with them confirming oh. that I oh. know that the appointments are not gonna be where they used to be. Oh, okay. So I've mi I missed parts of the lecture and it's one lecture I did not wanna miss parts oh, of. Oh, well, you'll, I mean, you'll... I've been to many of Emily's lectures and I really don't like to miss a single word. Oh, thank so. you. Okay, you well, and I hope everything's okay. It's thank well. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, and Emily, I agree with everyone's comments. This was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. And we'll talk. You'll come back I, soon, I hope. I hope so. You're a great yeah. audience. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And have a great night, yeah, afternoon, pleasure. everyone. Good All evening. All right, everybody. Stay be safe. safe. Thank you. You don't have to drive, so you are where you need to be. <laughs> and uh, good. Right. And we'll be in touch, Emily. Thank Bye, you everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Bye -bye. Thanks. Hope to see you all soon. And fill out your evaluations, as I said earlier. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.